Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's guest is Dave. Dave, welcome to the show. Hi Vic, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Dave, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm currently 23 years old. Uh, I live in Brazier Falls, New York. Uh, I grew up in Herman, New York. After high school, I moved up here with my mother. And, of course, during high school, she was kind of all over the place. She lived uh, in Fort Covington. She lived on the reservation. And then she lived off the reservation. She moved here to Brazier Falls. And everywhere she's gone, I've went with her. Mostly lived out in the woods. Not a big fan of living in towns or living anywhere there's too many people. I'm an avid hunter. I love being out in the woods. Uh, I do play video games, but not as much as I used to. Uh, currently going to SUNY Potsdam. I am a biology major. As far as other activities, uh, any outdoor activities such as fishing, even bow fishing, uh, I love to do that stuff. Most of the time, I'll be working, cutting wood. I am working as a forester for Environment Division, Akosasni, the uh, reservation over in Hogansburg. For you to spend as much time out in the woods as you do to this day after your family having the experiences they've had, you've got to have a lot of moxie to do that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. Speaking of your family, we're going to talk about your mom's experience first. Before we get into that, though, does your mom have any interest in cryptids to this day? She really hasn't had that much interest in cryptids. She never really was into it. Back in the day, I mean, growing up, most of the tales on the reservation were meant to scare kids, although there has been some truth behind them. But um, as she grew up, she grew out of it, didn't really fear anything out in the woods. She didn't really take anything to her mind. She did watch horror movies, but she never thought of them as real, or, or she just thought of them as entertainment. And of course, up until now, when I pester her about her encounter that she had out back, she gets a little bit more interested in And I was actually finally able to get her to watch two episodes of Dogman Encounters. So I think I'm kind of making progress on her. When she did listen to those two episodes, how did she react? Her reaction, I was actually surprised. It actually did kind of scare her a little bit because the two episodes she watched were the Monster in the House episodes 1 and 2, and that explained all the unexplained animal attacks. And, of course, when she was listening to ones where people were attacked in their own homes, that made her feel uneasy. And, of course, we live out in the woods, so that would kind of have a reason to get you all jittery and spooked. Yeah, when you're living out in the woods like that, sometimes you'll hear things that are uh, unnatural, sometimes make your hair stand up on the back of your neck. Oh, I don't doubt that at all. When you were small, did your mom ever tell you that monsters didn't exist? My mother, my dad, most everybody, they always used to tell me they never existed. My uncle, on the other hand, they used to scare me a lot when I was a kid, because they were really big into the paranormal. I mean, they even went as far as Halloween, way they took like really seriously. They used to get everybody over to the house, and we'd always watch horror movies every year. Usually, not really slasher films, mostly just the classic monster films. And one of the films that we were shown was Silver Bullet, and we were all down in the basement. They all the lights turned off, and my uncle took it as far as dressing up as a werewolf, and he actually sat behind us. And whenever there's a scary part, you'd pick somebody and you'd grab them. And he grabbed me one night, and as soon as he did that. I took off running, and they never saw me again that night. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty dirty. <laughs> it was bad. I, needless to say, was not going into that basement for at least another six years after that. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand. You're a werewolf aficionado. Of all the werewolves in movies you've seen, which werewolf scares you the most? Most definitely the beast from an American Werewolf in London, mainly due to its size 
and overall appearance and its ferocity. I mean, most other werewolf films, they are pretty ferocious, but nothing I don't think in any other movies depicts a werewolf attack as brutal as they were shown in that film. And overall, its design, I mean, I kind of guesstimated it's probably around, almost around the size of a black bear, so for a werewolf, that's actually fairly large, even if it's a quadruped. But just that one alone is the only one that creeps me out. Even after watching that movie, it freaks me out to go outside in the dark. Yeah, when John Landis created that creature, he definitely got it right. Definitely. He scared a lot of people with that thing. After having had your experience and seeing how your mom reacted to hers, did that reduce your enthusiasm for watching movies with werewolves in them? Um, although it did scare me, and it freaked me out, uh, I still continue to watch those movies. I just watch them now without as much fear as I had when I was a child. So, usually when I watch them, it's like, you know, it's, I just watch it for the entertainment. It's not like when I was a kid, when I used to watch it, I was always sitting in the chair waiting for those next parts of the film where they were going to attack somebody and then I'd always hide or whatever behind the chair under a blanket. Nowadays, I just love watching the films. Nothing scares me about them. Not even the documentaries that show uh, eyewitness encounters and that. They still entertain me. Nothing scares me now. But needless to say, going out in the woods, I'm still definitely watching around my six, keeping an eye out, listening. I'm glad you do. And I can understand why things on television wouldn't affect you very much anymore, considering you've been through the real thing. Oh, definitely. Once you hear things and see things, it really starts to mess with your head a little bit, but then part of your head says, well, as long as you keep your wits about you, you should be fine. Yeah, when you experience it in real life, there's a big difference. Please tell us about the area where you and your mom had your experiences. Well, the First there is on the Akwazuski Mohawk Reservation. The area around there is there's quite a bit of swamp. Most of the reservation is nothing but swampy areas, but the rest is hardwoods and there's very few pine forests there. The area behind my grandmother's house, there's mostly hardwoods, but it has sections of really thick underbrush. There's a lot of dogwood back there. A lot of crab apple trees and apple trees. And then, of course, there's meadows that have been cut out back there because my grandfather used to have a few when uh, they had the farm. And we do have one fairly large pine and hemlock forest that sits right next to the meadow. And then, of course, if you go further back, that's where the swamp starts. And since Ducks Unlimited came in there and dug out all the ponds for the ducks, and the geese, so they had better breeding habitat. There's a small creek that runs back there. It's actually fairly deep. The creek itself that they dug out was about 10 foot deep uh, without water. And then once you got past that 10 foot mark, that's when the water started. So initially, the creek bed itself is probably close to 15 or 20 feet deep. So the only way to get across is by bridge. And most of it is cattails. There's a lot of areas that are just barren because nothing grew there. It's mostly mud and dirt. And then behind the swamp is the really thick hardwoods. There's maple, oak, birch, pretty much any plant species you can name off. I don't know if you knew this or not, but dogmen seem to love swamps. I did not know that. Yeah, they do seem to love them. Whenever I hear about all these missing persons cases around swampy areas, I really get suspicious because they really do seem to love them. Me out because uh, where I'm working currently, we uh, we've walked through some very large swamps. I don't know if it's because people normally don't go into them or what, but yeah, there do seem to be a lot of cases of them being around areas like that. One afternoon in 1977, your mom went on a horseback ride that turned out to be unlike any ride she'd ever been on before. Please tell us what happened that day. Well, she used to have a horse that she named Dancer. And she used to go out horseback riding quite a bit. She loved it. Well, one day she went out. She was by herself. And, of course, she took the long trail that we have back there. That uh, It's actually a four-wheeler trail. Back then, I think it was mostly just for the tractor and the horses because they didn't have a four-wheeler at that time. And she was riding back. She got about halfway across where the meadow is. The meadow was 
Uh, I was probably grown up at the time. I wasn't brush hogged. But she got across the meadow, and there's an area that we have as the landmark. We call it the porcupine tree because it's a big maple tree. The porcupines had killed, so they pretty much hollowed it out. It's still standing there today, but it's a very, very large tree. And at that tree, there was a fence. The fence cut across and marked the boundary between my grandfather's property and the neighbor's. And right where that tree was, there was also a gate. And the gate was used for the cattle to go back and forth onto our property and their property, which they had cattle as well, so they shared the farming land. She got just about to that point where the tree is, and her horse just went berserk. He stopped. He was making all kinds of noises. He was turning his head around, and finally his ears perked up. He looked in one direction, and as soon as he looked in that direction, my mom looked over. And she saw this thing standing over near this small hemlock tree. And the hemlock tree was dead at the time, so it had no needles or anything on it. So she could see it clear as day. Even though it was a little bit dark in that area, she definitely could still see the outline of the creature. And it was fairly large. But she noticed that it had its hand up on a branch. And when she looked at the creature, she did say she noticed the ears on the top of the head. And she noticed on the hand that there were fairly large claws. And as soon as she saw that, of course, this was in a few seconds before the horse decided to just dart. So as she looked at that thing, she had just a little bit of time to look and see what it was. And then the horse took off, almost knocking her off the horse. She held on for dear life, and he just ran as fast as he could back to the house, and he was gone. And, of course, after they got back to the house... She made sure the horse was back in the barn, and she got back into the house, and of course, she was freaked out. She didn't know what just happened. She was pretty much blanked out at the time. The only thing going through her head was fear. She got in. My grandmother asked her what was wrong, calmed her down, and it took a little while to calm her down, but after that, she completely forgot about what happened, and everything was back to normal, but she still wouldn't go back outside. And... My grandmother and my grandfather, from what my grandmother was telling me, said that they went out in the barn and Dancer was still going nuts. He was still shaking up and he was still scared. My grandfather ended up going back out after my mom came back. And this is what my grandmother told me after the uh, encounter my mom had. He went out back and took a walk back to the big maple tree that was there to see what she saw. And, of course, my grandfather, when he got back there, noticed that there was a footprint underneath this hemlock tree that she saw this thing standing right under. And the branch that it had its arm up on was about his head height, maybe his shoulder height. So this creature that was standing there obviously was fairly tall because if it had its hand on a branch that was about my grandfather's shoulder and head height, that would have to mean the creature was probably well over eight or nine feet tall. He saw the footprint there on the ground, and, of course, he thought it was a bear. He didn't understand at the time. He's seen plenty of tracks, but he went back to the house where his supplies were, and he had just enough stuff to make a mold. It was kind of like a... It wasn't really meant for making cast of footprints, but it was more used for fixing up sidewalks and that. But he took it back, and he molded the footprint. And, of course, the stuff was very, really, very, very brittle. So you couldn't really drop it. You couldn't hit it because the footprint would just smash. So he brought it back to the house. But all the whole time he was back there, my grandmother said that he was very uneasy. He never was like that before. He was never scared of the woods. But when he came back, he was just completely creeped out. Didn't understand what was wrong. And most of the day he was quiet. He showed her the footprint. And she thought it was a bear. He thought it was a bear. Nothing out of the abnormal. So they put the footprint away, and that was that. But all throughout the night, she said that he had a hard time sleeping. So obviously something was up. So he, I think that he knew something out of the normal was back there, and probably watching him while he was taking the footprint. And after that, I mean, he was a little bit more cautious about going out back there. And, of course... With the footprint that they made, this led up to the events of him having his strokes. 
and I was not able to uh, actually talk with him more about his encounter because by the time I was old enough to do so, he's already had like his eighth stroke, I believe, and he was unable to speak clearly. It affected most of his nervous system. He couldn't really move around as well as a normal human would. He was bound to a wheelchair. His speech was slurred. So he really had to, usually it was with a notepad that he had to get people to, uh, say, if he had to go to the bathroom, he'd have to write out a notepad, or my grandmother usually would understand him. But at that time, I was unable to speak with him. But uh, that was about it for that encounter. Do you still have that cast your grandfather made of that print? The unfortunate thing about the print is that got smashed years back. This was before I was actually able to go and speak with my grandmother more about it, because this was back when I was probably 11 or 12, and I had not yet heard of Dogman, and I was still really kind of a rookie with the paranormal at that time, so I didn't really understand much of it about Bigfoot or whatever. I had the books, but I was just starting to learn about that stuff. And I just recently learned, it was, I think, a couple of years ago, that the footprint had gotten smashed. I'm not sure what year it must have been smashed, but I know that she said my nephew accidentally took it out of the cupboard and he dropped it. And, of course, the material was so brittle that when it hit, it just shattered into small pieces, so it was beyond repair. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. You told me that when you took a look at that print, you noticed some interesting features. What were they? As I can remember back when I was, this was still in my high school days. I was able to look at the footprint. This is before I knew anything about the dog man, of course. And I just took interest in looking at the footprint because I just wanted to see what it was. Because at the time, when I was getting more and more into hunting with my father, he was always showing me different footprints. I'd seen black bear footprints at the woodlot. I've seen coyotes. I've seen all kinds of canine prints around. I've seen all kinds of bird prints, everything you could possibly think of. But this print was really creepy because when I compared it to a bear, because at the time I actually had a smartphone. This was like the first smartphone I had, so I was able to use the Internet and actually look at it. I looked at it and I said, no, it wasn't a bear print because I looked at it and I was like, well, this print is kind of abnormal. It has the same characteristics as a wolf print but not just the characteristics of a wolf print it was just much larger and was actually elongated and if you look at the footprint closely it actually had the indent of the dew claw on the back so you could actually see that imprinted in the cast and I was like well that's kind of odd and I looked further at the footprint and I noticed it was really long in shape and I was like well that's kind of weird nothing around here has a shape a foot that's close to 14 inches long. I noticed when he took the print, it was in mud. My grandmother told me about the print. said that, yeah, he had to take the cast in a bunch of mud because where the thing was standing, the ground was really soft and muddy. So the print itself showed where the paunch of the foot had indented into the mud, so you could actually tell that, well, this had to have been a canine because the paunch had literally indented into the mud about one or two inches. So you can clearly see the foot, the claws, the dew claw, and the haunch that was rubbing up against the mud that was on the backside of the print. So I thought that was really odd when I saw that. You mentioned that print was about 14 inches long, but how wide was it? The print itself, let's see, if I compare it to my foot, I wear a size 13, and my foot is about a little over 4 inches across, maybe 5 and a half. So the footprint itself compared to mine was probably close to 7 to 8 inches wide. That's a pretty big print. It is fairly large. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say so. Since you were 5, you used to ask your mom about her encounter. Something about her responses confused you, though. What was it that confused you? Oh, I used to pester her a lot. Not so much now. I mean, I still like to talk about it. But back when she first started telling me about it, She never really got into the details about her encounter. I said, well, what did it look like? What did it look like? I was always asking her, what did it look like? And she just says, well, it was really tall. She saw the hand, and she said, it just looked like a big foot. And it just went on for years, and I was like, I was trying to get details out of her. I said, try and think back to what you saw. Like, what did you see? 
what do you remember about the details of what you saw? And then finally one day, this is actually, we were driving back from Malone, and I was bored in the car, so I decided to get her to talk about her encounter a little bit more. She said, well, I didn't remember seeing ears on its head. And I started thinking, I was like, wait, 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 ears? On the sides or on the top? She's like, well, on the top of the head. I'm like, oh, okay. And it's like, that can be a Bigfoot, because Bigfoot is more of a primate, so its ears are on the side, they're not pointy. And as soon as she said that, I started to think, this could be a dogman, because at this time when I finally got the details out of her, I'd already seen dogman encounters multiple times, so this immediately rang the bell in my head. I was like, that's definitely not a Bigfoot. And then she mentioned the claws on the fingers, and I said, well, Bigfoot does have claws, but to the extent of what she saw, dogmen always have claws on their fingers because they're a canine, so being a canine, they obviously have to have those claws for subduing prey, you know, tearing apart flesh, you know, it's making it easier to, to eat. The Bigfoot sometimes may have claws, sometimes they'll have more human-like fingers, so they'll have fingernails that are closer to a human. So I started thinking about that, and I was like, well, that's definitely a dog, man. It can't be a Bigfoot. And then she did mention the legs, and she said the legs looked just like a canine one. They were the backward-facing legs that you would see on a dog or, you know, any kind of canine or even a, a deer. If you were to see the deer, when they bend their legs down, they have the distinct bend in their leg. And, of course, I started thinking about that. I was like, that's definitely not a Bigfoot, because, like I said, they're more humanoid in stance. So, over those years of her telling me these details, and finally, just recently, I got those details about what she saw. It immediately rang the bell in my head. I was like, that's definitely got to be a dogman. Not sure what type of dogman, but it was definitely one. Yeah, it just sounds like a canine type dog man to me. And just so you know, Sasquatch, they never have claws. They always have fingernails and toenails. Some people mistakenly classify type 3 dog men as being a type of Sasquatch, but they're not. They can look similar in ways to a Sasquatch, but they're definitely not a Sasquatch. Since your grandfather passed away, like you said, before you were old enough to take an interest in your mom's encounter, did you talk much with your grandmother about what had happened? I just remember talking with her a few times. This was about 2014, I believe. This is currently when I was working at the housing division. Because I went over and had lunch with her a couple times. And, of course, I like to strike up conversation with her, so I brought it up. And she talked with me more about the encounters and my grandfather. And she always did tell me about my grandfather being uneasy about the woods sometimes and he, you know, being native and being an avid outdoorsman, he was never scared of the woods, but sometimes there is just days that he felt really, really, really uneasy. And of course we got into talking about what she has seen and she hasn't really seen very much. There, the one time she's actually, or two times actually, she's seen weird phenomena around the house. The first time was back when we originally used to have an old farmhouse there. She has a new house now. But the old farmhouse, uh, the windows were about 10 feet off the ground. So no, any normal human being couldn't just walk up to the window and look in there. But she did think she saw a Bigfoot one day. Wasn't Definitely couldn't have been a dog man because she said um, she did not see the ears on the head. She said it looked more humanoid. And it looked into the window at them while they were eating dinner. And my grandfather never saw it. She was the only one that saw it. Of course, after that happened, it disappeared. My grandfather went outside and looked, couldn't find anything, didn't see footprints. And then the second thing she saw was, I think, more of a UFO-related phenomena, because she looked into the driveway one night, and there was a, an orb of light that was in the driveway, and it sat there spinning and spinning and spinning. And finally, it zipped down the driveway and disappeared. That's really all she's seen as far as paranormal activity around the house. But she did say that my grandfather, when he came to the woods, uh, he was a little bit more uneasy when he went back there. But it was only for a, a few years because after his first stroke, he was unable to go back because he was bound to the wheelchair. But um, he said that it's very odd because of who he was. He used to go hunting all the time. I mean, he used to go out with my uncles. And, of course, he fought 
Well, I don't know. I'm not sure if he was actually in combat or not. He was in Germany after World War II. He uh, was an engineer. He cleaned up after most of the war, I believe. I think he might have actually been over there while they were still fighting, but this was like towards the very, very end, just before the Germans surrendered on May 6th. And he cleaned up a lot of landmines now over there, and he actually witnessed one of his friends get killed by one. So, of course, he was really good at handling stuff that would make most people kind of lose their mind, because they only seen somebody get killed by something like that is pretty unsettling. He was around in the woods over in Germany quite a bit, and he never thought of anything abnormal around there. And, of course, their woods over there are actually quite creepy, from what he said. But other than that, around here... He was never very uneasy, and it wasn't until that day of the encounter that he actually was more unsettled about being in the woods. You mentioned earlier, Dave, that your grandfather had had two experiences of his own. Please go ahead and tell us about those now. The first encounter he had was, I think, more along the lines of a Sasquatch. This was out back of our house, because this is back where both the encounters were. Just different spots. The Sasquatch that he encountered, he... Definitely could see it. He saw it walking along the tree line where he was walking. But he didn't have that uneasy feeling like he was in danger. Because on the res, Bigfoot is thought of more as a protector and more of a spiritual being. There's actually a painting I've seen on the reservation about Bigfoot. That was it? My uncle took me over to the library, I believe is where I saw it. And he dug it out of a box and it actually depicts a picture of a Sasquatch defending two native hunters from a pack of wolves. And it was actually a really interesting photo to see. I never got to see it again. I actually went back and asked them about it and they didn't know where it was. But, um, my grandfather also saw that painting that they made. Of course, after he saw that, I mean, he was never big into Bigfoot, but the legends had always circulated around the reservation. It's really big on the res. And, he always thought of it as a protector. The chiefs, you name it, everybody throughout the res, everyone that was native thought of it as a spiritual being, a protector. Nobody that's going to hurt you unless, you know, of course you aggravated it somehow. But when he saw that out back of the house, he didn't feel like he was in danger. He just kept going about his business back there. And he actually thought that it was protecting him because it was following him everywhere. It followed him all around the back of the property. And he thought it was kind of strange that why it was following him. It was keeping its distance, but it just kept an eye on him like it was protecting him from something. And, of course, a few, I think it was a few weeks after that, he went back there. And when he went back, he had that unsettling feeling he was being watched, but he also had that feeling he was in danger. And he just got that feeling that it's like, this couldn't be the Bigfoot that's around here. There's something else back here that is watching him. And he actually did say that he smelt really a really nasty stench when he was back there. It was like a mixture between like a wet dog and rotting meat. My grandmother was telling me that he heard what he smelt. Uh, he never wrote this stuff down. This is all by her memory. I kind of wish that he wrote it down. Anyway. He smelt that back there, and of course he felt very, very uneasy about it. He actually ended up going back to the house because of that, and he didn't go back there for a few other days, but when he did go back, he made sure he brought his rifle back with him because after the war, he brought back an old German Mauser Car 98. It's an 8mm round, so it's a very large round. If you were to hit something with that, it would probably definitely put a hurting on it. But he always carried that back with him. And my, he always told my uncles to bring some kind of firearm with them when they went back there. But as far as his experiences, those were the only ones that he's had up until his stroke bound him to the wheelchair. And that was about it for him. That had to be so frustrating for him. Here you have a man who just loved being out in the woods, and then next thing you know he has these experiences, including the one your mother had, that take away his ability to really relax and enjoy being out there. Definitely. I mean, she said that he loved the woods. I mean, he was an avid outdoorsman. He really enjoyed being out there. When we were younger, I mean, he loved having us around the house. He loved having the kids around, me and my other cousins. He just loved having us around. But my grandmother said there were some nights where, I mean, even though it was hard to understand because of the stroke, he wished that he was able to take us out and 
enjoy the woods with us or be outside with us and actually be able to take us out and do activities, but unfortunately wasn't able to do that. That really is a shame. At least it sounds like he lived a really full life. Oh yeah, he was up there in age. He wasn't able to do much because of the wheelchair, but every single chance I got to go over and see him, I always sat down next to him when he was watching TV. He was always watching his westerns, his war, old war movies. And I'd sit there and I'd talk to him. And of course, I'd, my grandmother said he just loved having us over. Me and my cousin Andrew, him and I were like the big movie fanatics back in the day. So we'd always sit there and we'd talk with him. And he would, I mean, it was hard to talk with him because of his slurred speech, but we got used to it. We could definitely understand him. And he understood us. It was just, it was always the time of our life when we went and saw him. But we really miss him because of that. I really wish he was around today. Oh, I can understand that. Yeah, I'm sure he had loads of interesting stories to share. I can only imagine. In 2011, you had some pretty disturbing experiences of your own. Please fill us in on them. The first encounter that started it all was when we lived in Fort Covington. We came up for a weekend and... One of my friends from high school came up with me. He woke up one morning and I was like, I don't want to play video games today. So I said, let's go out and do something. And of course, my mom, she had property around the house. The neighbors let us go out back because we didn't own it. They owned it. It wasn't very big, so we couldn't really do much. There was a pond back there. We used to catch bullfrogs. But I got bored back there. I was like, let's go over to my grandmother's house. She said, uh, we should bring a bunch of plywood and that, get the four-wheeler, you know, and go build a bridge across the creek. I said, there's no beaver house over there. Let's go build a bridge across that creek and get over into the beaver house and fool around in there. So I said, all right. So we got all of our stuff together, a bunch of old plywood, a bunch of old boards that my stepfather didn't want. And we went back, got all the stuff under the four-wheeler, drove back. And, of course, we had to lug all the rest of the stuff back to the creek. And at this time, it wasn't all complete swamp like it used to. When I was younger... The uh, property back to the entire swamp was just, it was just nothing but a mud hole. There was no place you can get across the swamp. There was one big pond in the middle of it, and that was it. But in 2011, uh, Ducks Unlimited had already came back there. Because my uncles had requested that they go back and dig out multiple ponds for the ducks and the geese. Because it made suitable breeding habitat for them. and it was easier to get across because there's actually a little road that you could take. So anyways, we had to lug some of the equipment through part of the swamp because the road didn't go all the way across it. And we got back and we had built the bridge. It took us maybe two and a half hours to finish it. wasn't anything you could drive a vehicle across, but you could definitely walk across it. And after we completed it, we walked across and we got over into the area where the hut was. So we were looking at this hut, and we noticed that this side of the beaver dam, or the beaver hut, was completely dug out with care. It looked like somebody had just dug out a perfect hole in the side of the hut. And, of course, the hut itself was fairly large. I mean, even for a, a beaver house, it was large, but it looked like somebody might have been adding to it because of its size. The hut itself had to have stood well over 12, maybe even 15 feet tall. So even a, a man himself, a six-foot man, wasn't able to look over the hut itself. Usually most beaver dams and beaver huts that you see, if there's dry ground, usually they aren't that tall because beavers really aren't. They're large animals, but they're not that large. But anyways, the hut itself was massive. I mean, I've never seen a, a hut that big. So we looked around, and we're looking at the hut. And I was like, this is kind of weird. It's like I don't think beavers would dig a hole out in the side of it because beavers only have a small compartment that they dig out underneath the house that goes out into the water, and that's the only way they can get in. They have other exits to get out, but it's mostly just to keep predators out. But something had dug a hole in the side of this hut, and it was big enough for, I mean, even a large man to fit into. And I said, well, I don't want to go inside of it, but I said, you're free to go into it. He's like, all right. So he got out his phone and his light, and he disappeared into the hut, and just as he got in there, he's like, dude, there's bones in here. He's like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, there's bones in here. I said, what kind of bones? He's like, oh, there's, uh, it looks like cow bones. And it's like, oh, wait, there's a cow skull. And I was looking inside, and I could just kind of see the light, and I was looking at it, and I could just see over against the wall. He's like, oh, yeah, there are skulls in there. 
I looked, and there's a cow skull, and he's like, oh, there's deer skulls in here. And he's like, oh, there's even a horse skull in here. And, of course, we're looking around, and he's like, man, there's bones everywhere in here. So, of course, he's like, all right, I'm going to go further, and he says, there's another hole in here. I said, all right, I'm just going to stay out here and wait. So I sat down, and he disappeared, and he didn't make a single sound. Because I couldn't hear him inside of the other part of the compartment that was inside of the hut. I could hear him scuffling around, that was about it. Well, he was inside the hut for probably six minutes tops. And I could still hear him scuffling around in there. And finally I got over to the hole and I yelled into him. I was like, uh, you done in there? And I didn't hear him. And then I could see the light from his phone. And he just came flying up out of the compartment that was inside the hut. And he came flying out of the hole that he came in through, grabbed me by the shirt. And we took off across the bridge, and I was like, what, the, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's like, let me go. It's like, what's wrong? And he just kept pulling me and pulling me and pulling me, and finally got to the four-wheeler. So he's like, get on the four-wheeler. And finally I got on. He's like, I wasn't making any notions as to what was wrong. He didn't tell me. He said, we're going back. And, of course, we just, he, I mean, he gunned it. He turned the four-wheeler around. He gunned it. He didn't care if we were going to wipe out or not on that thing. He was gone. So I'm holding on for dear life on this thing, and he's just flying back to the the house. And, of course, we left some of our stuff back there, so it was kind of no point in going back because he wasn't going to go back and get it. And we went flying back to the house. We parked, and we sat inside in the living room, and I was asking him what was wrong, and he was just really quiet, and he had this really, really, really weird look on his face. Like he was terrified, like he'd seen a ghost. And he actually was really pale. So. We were quiet and really talked much, and eventually, you know, we just sat there watching TV, and he actually struck up a few conversations, completely forgot about the incident. But it was still in the back of my mind, I was still sitting there thinking about it. And finally, my mom came, and she picked us up, and we got back to the house, and I figured, ah, let's go upstairs, watch some movies, play some games. So we went upstairs, and I turned on the PS2, and of course, we were playing games for a while, and all of a sudden, he's like, you're not going to believe what I saw. It's like, what do you mean? Like, he didn't tell me before. It's like, like I was shocked, man. It's like, you're not going to believe what I saw down there, though. I said, well, what did you see? He's like, well, it wasn't just the bones, but he said the, the odd thing was there was there was clothes down there. Like, what do you mean there's clothes? Like, there's human clothing down there. Adults, children, even infant clothes down there. But they're all, like, tattered, old, and something had used it to make, like, a bed down there, like a nest. I said, a nest. It's like, yeah, there's something made a nest down there. It was huge. I mean, it's like a bear could have sat in that thing and slept comfortably. It's like, you're kidding. I said, nope. And he said, the other scary thing was uh, not just the bones down there of animals, but he said one of the bones that was down there, shockingly, it looked almost like the femur from a human. And he's like, I know a lot about these bones. I've seen a lot of the bones around here from different animals. He said, that looked human. Like, it didn't look like it was from a deer or anything. It looked like it was from a human. And I said, did see a human skull? And he's like, no, I didn't see a skull. There were a lot of deer skulls down there. But you know, he said a lot of the bones resembled that of a human. He said there's even the rib bones down there that look very similar to a human. And he said he saw a spine that he said might have been a deer, but he said it shockingly looked just like a human spine. And it wasn't until he said he saw a jacket that was laying over in the corner, and he said what really, really freaked him out was the jacket had these distinct claw marks in it that went down the front of the jacket and pretty much completely through the jacket and he didn't say anything about blood stains but he said it completely freaked him out when he saw it and it wasn't until he saw that he decided to get out but he said there's another compartment that was inside of that hut there was like three chambers in it there was the top there was the second one that he was in where he found that little nest and then there was another dark hole that something had dug out further into the ground and he said it was pitch black down there. He didn't want to go down. But he said he swore he could hear something in there. And he got out, and that's when he grabbed me, and we took off on the four-wheeler. And he said that there's also this distinct smell down there. He said it was awful. It was like wet dog, and just it smelled like rotten meat, like something had been rotting down there. And he said there's also the other scary thing. He said there was fur in that bed. He said there was hair. It was all over the place. Like something was shedding. And I was like, that's kind of creepy. I mean, it's like, I know dogs shed, but he's like, it wasn't no dog. 
I mean, did you see any footprints? He's like, nah, the ground was way too hard because it was all dried out. They hadn't seen any moisture in there, so nothing could really make a distinct footprint in there. Once that happened, once he was freaked out, he just got out of there. He couldn't handle it no more. He just wanted to get out because, I mean, once the hair stood up on the back of his neck, he was gone. And he wasn't really much to get scared back then. Yeah, it was really, really hard to scare that guy. But he told me everything about the hut, like I just mentioned. He was never one to lie to me. I've trusted him pretty much my entire life. You know, we knew each other for quite a while. I still know him. Haven't seen him in a long time because he moved away. He was always truthful, never told me a lie, and I immediately believed him. So whatever he saw down there was definitely not normal. Oh, I'd say it wasn't. It sounds like a den of horrors to me. It was definitely a den of horrors. That When he told me that that night, I couldn't sleep for a while. I was actually, it was just going through my head. I was picturing what he saw. And I actually ended up having a couple of like, night terrors that night, and I was starting to think about it. I never saw anything in it. I just was picturing the den and the claw marks. And then the only thing that I could think of, like, as soon as I woke up, was, like, that word was in the back of my head, but I just didn't want to think about it. And I was just, like, werewolf was just indented in the back of my head. And it freaked me right out. So I woke him up, and I was like, dude, it's like... I'm not going to lie, but man, whatever you saw down there, whatever you smelt, it's like it's kind of ringing the werewolf bell down there. And he's like, I don't even want to think of that word right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame him. Had you heard about anyone going missing back when you and your friend found that structure? I never heard any word about people going missing. I know that even nowadays there's actually a lot of reports of people going missing. I know a lot of it's criminals because of the reservation. I mean, there's quite a bit of crime that revolves around there. But there have been some missing children around there, a couple missing adults. But nothing I've heard about people being missing because of an animal attack or being missing out in the woods. They've never really released full details about that. I'd actually probably would have to ask my brother-in-law because he is, he works for the tribal police. He's actually a tribal cop, so I could actually ask him. When you consider what your friend said he saw, it sure does make you wonder. Did you tell any of your friends about that structure and what your friend said he had seen inside? We kept it to ourselves after high school. We didn't really mention it. A lot of my friends that I had at the time well, laughed at it. You know, they said, ah, oh, you didn't see anything. It's like, you're making it up. It's like, no, it's like, we're not making it up. I said, I'll even show you the hut. It's like, I'll bring you back there. And, like, as soon as I said that, Curtis, like, don't take them back there. And it's like, well, why not? He's like, don't take them back there. It's like, I'm serious. It's like, I, I've i never had a feeling like that before, such fear. It's like, don't go back there. It's not safe. And I was like, well, i got to show them the hut. It's like, well, maybe I'll just bring them up close enough to see the hut itself, but not go inside. After I said that, he's like, well, I still don't want you to go back there. It's like, man, it's like, you're my best friend. It's like, still, it's... It's not normal. It's like, what I saw down there was not normal. He said, don't go back there. So I took his word for it, and I just, I never went back there. I still haven't been back there to this very day. Most of my other friends, like my two of my best friends in high school, uh, after he had left, they actually tried persuading me multiple times to go back there. And we went back, uh, I think it was in 2014, we went and played Airsoft back there. And then at the end of the day, they're like, hey, we should go see that hut. We should go see the hut. And I was like, nope, we're not going back there. And they said, oh, come on, let's go back there. We got the four-wheeler. It's like, nope, we're not going. And, of course, I was like, I got that feeling in the back of my head. I was like, yeah, we're not going to go back there. So I told them, that's that. We're not going. So they always said, I think you guys were lying about that. And I said, well, if you want to go see it, then go see it. It's like, but if you go missing, don't blame me. <laughs> so... One of my buddies was actually bold enough to go back by himself, and he went back there, and he got fairly close to the, the hut. But the creepy thing was, is he said that when he got to the bridge, he said he thought he heard something moving around back there, so he just came flying back to the four-wheeler and came back to the house, and that was it. How developed was that area around that beaver dam? As far as houses and that, the nearest house was my grandmother's, but that hut itself was maybe three miles back but the highway was another five or six miles further back if you were to head straight back from the hut most of the area around there was woods so you probably if i was going to give a guesstimate as far as the acreage around that area 
there's well over a thousand acres, I'd say maybe even two thousand acres. So anything that was in that area, they're definitely well hidden because there's not much activity back there. My uncle may go back there. He has the shooting range, but that's still quite a ways away from the hut. I don't think my uncles really drive back there very much nowadays because I think from what I heard, the beavers have flooded out quite a bit back there. So it's very hard to move around. But as far as that, most other people, there really is not much activity around there other than the animals. That's about it. There's no longer cattle or horses because the farm's gone. It does sound like it's an awfully remote area. Definitely remote. They do hunt back there, but I don't think they go as far back as the hut. Have you heard about anyone else having any other experiences back there? Um, As far as experiences, I haven't really heard anything in that exact area, but there are other areas on the res where people have had encounters with creatures that they don't really know or understand. One that actually came up in particular was what they called the Cook Road Car Cruncher. This was, I can't remember what year it was, this was definitely back when I was just a kid. My uncle still worked for the environment division at the time, he still does work there. A woman had called in and said something attacked her car. And whatever attacked her car was going after a cat that had went up into the wheel well of the vehicle. And whatever attacked it had completely torn the side of the vehicle apart and completely tore off part of the wheel well and got into where the tire was. Actually, had popped the tire. They took pictures of it. They took pictures of what the car looked like after the attack. And not just that, but they had a distinct police report on it. And the police report stated they took DNA samples of saliva and hair that was found on the vehicle. The weird thing about the attack was that there was claw marks on the side of the car, and they said they were fairly large. They said it wasn't a dog that made it. They didn't really get further into details other than what was wrong with the car, and they said that they found bits and pieces of a cat, because the cat that was in there obviously didn't make it. Whatever was attacking the car got the cat. They sent the DNA samples in, and they ended up getting them back. And at the time they got them back is when things really started to stir up in town because the DNA test came back as an unknown canine. My uncle thought this was really creepy, and he ended up printing off the original police report and showed it to me when I was a kid. And I read it, and it creeped me out because, like, immediately I was thinking, like, werewolf. And, of course, that's what he was trying to scare me with. I mean, he obviously didn't know what it was. It was still registered as an unknown canine at that time. The really odd thing that happened was as soon as that police report came back, it wasn't like until I think two days later, the government actually had come to the reservation. They went to environment division. They came in at night and they were somehow able to unlock the door. They got inside, went into the lab. They took every single DNA sample they had in there. They went through all their files. They cleaned out every single file they had on the car attack and Everything about it had just vanished. They didn't have any information left on it. My uncle had a couple files at his house, which he kept secret. But it was just mostly just the reports and what they wrote down of DNA samples and that. And I'm not sure what he's done with them. I know he had pictures on his phone, the original pictures of the attack. But I know that just the main fact that they said unknown canine was what really creeped me out. But the government coming in and actually taking away the files and all the samples that they had in the lab really rung some bells. And after that, nothing really came up. And it wasn't until recently, which was weird, I saw a post on, I think it was Crypto Mundo. The website had the report on there, but the report was changed. And the picture that was on there was changed. And I looked at the original picture that my uncle had, and I said, well, this, this picture's not showing the claw marks on it. It looks like it was photoshopped. And you look at the car on the original, and you can see the claw marks on it, and the bite marks, and then you look at the the new photo, and it just shows a destroyed part of a car. You could look at it, and you didn't really see any bite marks or claw marks, and it looks like they were photoshopped out. And they also placed the blame on a pit bull in the new article. They said it was a pit bull that attacked the car and killed the cat. The weird thing was, the tire that was in the original photo was completely ripped to shreds. And the new photo showed the tire as not even being damaged and completely inflated, nothing wrong with it. And it just showed the fiberglass and the metal parts of the car 
scratched up and ripped apart, and that was it. And that was what it was really creepy because, well, the original was a true photo. It's like that wasn't Photoshop. That was right off my uncle's phone. It was right off the camera that they used to take pictures of the attack scene. And somebody had literally gone in, took that original photo, and changed it and made it look like it was just a dog attack. And that really, really, really creeped me out. But I knew it was really suspicious because being one of the people that actually saw the original report and seeing this new one, I knew that something was up and it was completely false, that it was not true. And blaming a dog was definitely not the right thing to do because it wasn't a dog that did it. A dog did not do that to that car. Pit bulls seem to always be blamed for incidents like that. Oh, definitely. Dogs seem to take the blame for just about every animal attack. I mean, it was like even when you mentioned in the Monster in the House episodes 1 and 2, the law enforcement placed the blame on feral dogs. They always do seem to do that. How close did you say that reservation is to where you were living at the time? At the time, in Fort Covington, the reservation was maybe five or six miles away. From where I'm living right now, the res is about ten miles away. So there's a little bit of distance between them, but there's a lot of state forest that actually borders between the res and where I'm currently living. So just about everywhere you go, the woods is linked some way, shape, or form. Yeah, sounds like one of these things would have the run of the place. Oh, definitely. Especially the fact that right now, where I'm living, I live next to Brazier State Forest, and I think the sign says that's over 18,000 acres, if I'm not mistaken. That's a lot of land. You tell me there was another experience you had back in 2011 when you were camping one night. This was during my cousin's graduation party. I was not old enough to drink at the time, but <laughs> still did it anyway. Kind of a rebel. At that time, I especially couldn't let my dad know because he would have definitely not been very happy. My mom wouldn't have either. At the graduation party, they brought back some Paps Blue Ribbon. They had some whiskey, and they got into it pretty heavy that night. I didn't really drink that much because I wasn't really into the taste of beer at that time, so I didn't really care for it. So I was sober. But both my cousins and my cousin's friend that he brought with him from Malone they were fairly drunk. And, of course, we had his dog with us. She's a purebred pit bull, if I'm not mistaken. She's a very, very nice dog. She would never bite anybody, but if she was going to defend my cousin, then she would definitely defend him. I've seen her angry on multiple occasions, but not aggressive towards most people, mostly aggressive towards strangers. But we were sitting down that night, and this was wicked, wicked late at night. This was about 3 o'clock in the morning. This was, like, right after... We actually ordered pizza at 1 o'clock in the morning and had them delivered to my grandmother's house, which I thought was kind of stupid because it's like, well, we're ordering pizza at 1 o'clock in the morning. I think they're going to get a little bit mad about that, but they didn't care. So we drove the four-wheeler out, got that, but we came back and ate it, drank our beer, ate our pizza, whatever, continued to talk, but it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I noticed there was something really weird going on because usually the night animals, the crickets, the frogs, uh, there was actually an owl that was near us at that one point in the night. He was fairly close and he was just hooting away and he didn't stop. He just kept going on for hours and he was fairly close because when he took off, I heard him fly off and as soon as he did that, the crickets pretty much shut up. The frogs were all shut up. They didn't make a single noise. Every animal in the area was just dead quiet. The wind was just really, really slow that night. You could just barely hear it going through the trees. Those guys, they didn't make anything of it because they were obviously too drunk to care about it. But I was sitting there in my chair, and I just noticed that something was really uneasy. I said, there's, there's something not natural in this spot. And, of course, as I was sitting there, I kept hearing something walking around our camp, and it was circling us, and it just circled us and circled us and circled us. And I could hear the branches snapping, and of course I'm trying to tell these guys, like, there's something circling the camp. It's like, there's nothing out there. It's like, there's nothing to be scared of. It's like, you're in the woods, you're going to hear stuff. I said, well, usually when you're out in the woods, you hear crickets. The night critters, they're always making noises at night. It's like, they usually do it all night long, right until dawn. And they said, well, maybe they went to sleep. It's like, well, just, oh my god, you guys, like, you're just ignoring me. So, I sat there, and I just kept listening and listening and listening and listening. And this thing was just circling, and it just wouldn't stop. It must have circled the camp at least 20 times. Finally, I told them, I was like, there's something out there. It's like, you guys need to listen to me. And they 
said, that's probably our uncles playing a joke on us. I was like, really? At 3 o'clock in the morning? Of course, we're yelling. We're like, oh, get out of here. It's like, you're not going to scare us. And finally, it stopped. And it just stood in one spot. When I didn't really hear it moving around. I heard branches snap a little bit, but it was in the same area. So I knew it was just sitting there watching us. Right before we finally went to bed, I got this really nasty smell. It came across me, and it was the smell of wet dog, like really putrid wet dog. And that really freaked me out because I was thinking, well, maybe it's Chauncey. Maybe she got wet. And I looked at her, and she came over, and I called her over, and I was petting her, and she wasn't wet. She was completely dry. And as soon as I did that, another branch snapped. As soon as she heard that, her head popped up, her ears went straight back, and her lips curled up, and she bared her teeth, and she started growling. And Dylan was just, he's sitting there in the chair, and he said, well, she's just growling at a friggin' rabbit or something. And I was like, there's no rabbit back there, so she wouldn't growl at that. She would chase it off. She wouldn't sit here and growl at it. She'd probably just chase after it. Dogs like to chase little animals like that just for fun. So we're sitting there and sitting there and sitting there, and this thing was still sitting over in the woods way out of our view. We couldn't see. It was pitch black. Even the fire wasn't lighting up the woods. And she just sat there snarling, and she wouldn't stop, and she sat there looking in the same place, and finally, it's like I started petting her a little bit, and then she kind of calmed down, and she just wouldn't stop looking in that same place. And, of course, we ended up staying up a little bit later, and finally, I was like, all right, I'm getting tired. Let's go to bed. So as we were getting ready to go to bed, she sat there and she just kept staring in the same spot. And I could still smell that wet dog. And, of course, I knew it wasn't Chauncey. Finally, I said, oh, let's go to bed. So we went into the wigwam and Chauncey was still sitting there. And finally, we called her and she came in. And she laid at our feet the rest of the night. And, of course, what really freaked me out was the fact that this wasn't a zip-up tent. It was just a wigwam that they made from a tarp and a bunch of birch trees that they cut down. The flap to the tent, you could easily lift it up and drag somebody out if you really wanted to, but, and the scary thing was, I was sitting in the middle of the tent, so, I was really uneasy about sleeping that night. I stayed up probably about another two hours when we were laying in the tent. Some of those guys had already gone to sleep, and uh, Chauncey was sitting at our feet for the rest of the night, and she was growling every once in a while. She'd hear a twig snap, and she'd growl. I think most of that night, the reason why we were probably all right till morning is because she stayed right there at the edge of the tent there, and she growled whenever something would move. So whatever was outside knew that, well, we had some form of protection in the tent, and there was also four guys, so it might not have been worth it to make any moves. Thank goodness she was there. She's actually a large dog. I don't think much. I mean, I mean if we're talking about a dog man here, I know a dog man, they ain't, you know, flinch bunch if they get attacked by a dog. I mean, I even saw that picture uh, a couple episodes ago, that artwork that somebody drew. I don't know who drew it, but they did an amazing job. The picture of the dog man leaning over a dead grizzly bear. Oh, Chris Chen. Yep, that picture was really, really, really nice. I loved that picture. In fact, I saved it to my phone. I actually used it as a background for a while. But um, when I saw that picture, I was like, well, if a dog man could do that to a bear... A dog ain't going to do nothing. So even with the dog we had there for protection, if they were hungry enough and they wanted to attack, they would probably still rip that place to shreds and us with it. (laughs) Even the biggest dog, I don't think that would be much of a problem for a dog, man. You mentioned how Chauncey perked up when she heard that twig snap, but when you started smelling that stench, did she give any reaction? Other than just her baring her teeth, my reaction when I saw her bare her teeth was just, I was ready to get up out of the chair and run, because as soon as she did that, I was like, this is not normal, this is not normal, I want to get out of here. The four-wheeler was, like, just within feet of us, so I was ready to get on it and just drive out. When she bared her teeth, it was the first time I've ever seen her really, truly bare her teeth and show signs of, like, super aggression, but just as soon as her ears perked back, like, I, it was kind of like that moment in a movie where you think, as soon as the dog perks its ears back, you start snarling, you think something's going to lunge out of the dark at you. But nothing happened apart from just her sitting there snarling, and we heard the twigs snapping, and that was it. And nothing else happened the rest of the night other than the occasional noises outside of the tent and the twigs snapping and her growling. But her reaction was, it was immediate. As soon as she heard that, ears perked back, bared her teeth, she was ready for a fight. 
So that I'm clear on it, from what you say, she didn't really have any reaction when you smelled that stench. She didn't actually react until that twig snapped. I'm pretty sure she could smell it. She didn't really sniff the air much, but I knew that she saw something. Because, of course, they can see better in the dark than we can. They see them black and white, and they can also see at night. We can't. So I knew that she must have at least seen it in the trees somewhere. So, obviously, she must have smelt it. All of her senses were pretty much perked right up at that point. Oh, okay, I follow you now. You say you've heard unusual howls on multiple occasions. Please tell us about those experiences. A lot of the howls I've heard, most of them were at my father's woodlot. This is down in Herman. So this is about probably 50 or 60 miles away from where I'm living right now, near Messina. The woodlot we were at, if you were to add everything together, including the land that we're allowed to hunt in the area, not just including ours that my father and my rest of my family owns, there's well over 800 acres, I'd say. But most of the activity that I hear is in the back of our camp. And the howls that I hear usually are during the winter. I've heard them a few times during the summer, not until really late at night. But most of it's during the winter. The howls I've heard were just at the end of our night set, on the very end of deer season. This would be the second weekend in December, I believe. Because December 13th, my birthday, is towards the last weekend of hunting season. That's the muzzleloading weekend. And then the weekend before that is the end of rifle. And those two weekends are when I hear it. But the howls that I've heard, the closest thing that they resemble are the howls that you would hear in the movie Ginger Snaps. I think every single movie that's the same howl. But the ones that they definitely resemble the best are from Ginger Snaps 3, the beginning. And it's actually more of like a moan crossed with a howl. That's what they're like. So it's really, really eerie when, when I hear them. But they echo through the woods. The woods just, it's so quiet during the winter you don't really hear very much but when as soon as you hear it it just echoes throughout the woods i've got to give it to you you definitely know your werewolf movies most people don't even know about ginger snaps i don't think it's really much of a known werewolf movie if i'm not mistaken because i didn't really learn about it till i was younger because i'd already seen most werewolf movies and i wanted to start watching them all and i came across ginger snaps I was like, I wonder if it's a B movie. It actually turned out to be pretty good. I mean, it's disgusting in some parts, but the third movie was probably the best out of them all. But when I listen to the howls in the movies, I tend to keep that sound in my head. So if I do hear something, I can actually compare it. Yeah, it was definitely it was a hair raiser. You'd be sitting there, and as soon as you heard it, the hair on the back of your neck would just stand up, and you'd get goosebumps everywhere. Oh, I can only imagine. Well, Dave, it's about time to get out of here. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Other than when people are out in the woods, definitely keep your senses at the highest because, I mean, I'm not one to be scared of the woods, but whenever I hear things like that, I know a lot of it is unnatural. So if anybody that's ever had an encounter, even people that haven't had an encounter, these things are definitely out there. I know it for sure. You know, my mom's seen them. I haven't personally had an encounter with one. I don't think I want to, but they are out there. I mean, they're as real as you and me, so if you're out in the woods, just keep your senses at the highest you can because you got to try and outsmart them. That's basically the best you can do is try and know that they're there before they see you. And then if you get a chance, get out of there. <laughs> Very well said. Well, Dave, thanks so much for your time coming on the show tonight and sharing these experiences with us. I really do appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, Vic. Thanks again for your time. Well, have yourself a great night. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.